This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of 40 Watt Podcast. My name is Philip. So excited to be with you. I am pumped to be here for a new episode. Uh, super excited about it, but a couple of things here at the top we're going to talk about. Uh, remember, you can help support the show over at patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast. Y'all hear me talk about it every week. Thank you to all of my Patreon supporters who we'll talk about at the end of the episode. Um, additionally, some things I don't always talk about that we ought to mention. So down in the comments or down in the description below, whether you're on YouTube or you're on your podcasting app, there are some links down there. I've got a couple of affiliate links that help keep the show going. Give me a little kickback when you buy things or you subscribe to things. Uh, there is a link for True Fire down there. Listen, get lessons, not more gear, y'all. Get the gear too, though. Um, but uh, get more lessons down there at True Fire. But if you absolutely have to buy the gear, you find yourself, you've got to buy something new. There's a, a Reverb affiliate link down there, so you can click that link. It costs you nothing, and I get a little kickback when you sign up for Reverb or you buy thing or when you sell things. No, it's when you buy things uh, on Reverb. Also, there's a link down there for String Joy Strings. I love String Joy Strings. Um, I use them on a bunch of my guitars, so click that link down there below. Um, additionally, there is, I have merch. Technically, there's a link down there. Um, I probably should update that and get you some new merch out there. Anyway, neither here nor there. Be sure to do me one big favor. Also, if you want to do something that's absolutely free to help support the show, like, subscribe, and share whatever platform you're on, whether you're listening or you are um, watching on YouTube. Like and subscribe. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you're listening. That helps new people find the show. It's a big deal because, you know, if people go to a show and there's not a review in the last six months to a year, they sort of wonder, hey, is anything still happening with this? So that had helped me out a whole bunch. Anyway, moving on. That's the self-shilling for the week. This week, <laughs> I've got a YouTuber, podcaster, well, going to be podcaster. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and guitarist Mark Hopkins on. Mark, how are you, sir? I'm great, Philip. Thanks for having me, buddy. This is this is the first time I've been on the other side of the lens, as it were. Oh, well then. I am always happy to uh, break that ice for somebody and they get to be the interviewed instead of the interviewee. I'll do um, my best to not try to interview you. Oh, it'll, it'll be... <laughs> actually, those, ten, those make the best episodes, though. Yeah, because I know, yeah. it, it's so much easier to... So, like, uh, with this podcast, I've had a lot of other podcasters and YouTubers on the show. Mm -hmm. and, and some people are like, you should get more players. Well, first of all, if you want to get me in touch with some of these players, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'm sending out messages. Sometimes they just don't get returned. But besides that, I find that people that also do this tend to create the most engaging conversations because yeah. you're used to talking. Oh, and I talk all day for work too, man. That's like oh. what I do for a living. So it's like I, I have been blessed with the gift of gab, as many <laughs> people have told me in my career. Um, so it, it's, it ain't no thing but a chicken wing, as it were. I mean, I, I'm, <laughs> I am definitely down to gab, and, and especially about music, uh, you know, in particular. I feel like there – I mean – I talk about it all day because I work for a music school, but, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, it's like, that's the easiest thing for me to talk about. I'm not going to talk about NASDAQ on here. I don't know. Anything about that. <laughs> that's good. Cause I'm lost. Like at that point, <laughs> once, once we, once we get into that stuff, we start talking all the acronyms, that alphabet soup is way lost on me. It's, Forget about it's it. funny. You do this though. And somebody gets on there and they ramble on, on for a story for like five or six minutes. Right. And they're like, Oh man, I'm so sorry. I rambled on. I'm like, no, no, that's the point. Keep keep talking. There, don't don't apologize for talking too much on a podcast. 
That's, yeah. That's the I thing. mean, as far as I'm concerned, bring it on. Let's just keep <laughs> on doing it, man. That's like, it. I, I had uh, last night on my show, I had Lee Pardini, who's the keyboard player in Dawes. And we were talking about that, um, especially after the show, we were hanging out talking. And at one point he's like, I'm sorry, that was a long winded way. I was like, dude, you could have <laughs> talked for the rest of the show and I would have been completely happy and content. Like you have everything interesting to say and I'm very happy to sit here and just soak up the knowledge. So I'm all about it. Um, but I really do. I appreciate you uh, asking me to do this. It's This is super fun. Yeah, no, super rad. So let's let's take a step back for just a second. Um, it's it's sometimes weird to spend a lot of time on this with somebody who is out here in this space, but let's do it anyway because we need to know just in case by some fluke my listeners don't know who you are. Uh, give a little bit how you got into this whole scene, how you got into music. What's up? So I, from a very very young age, um, was pretty entranced by music i would say Mm -hmm. um i'm the black sheep of my family like my brother i have an older brother and an older sister my sister's eight years older than me my brother's four years older than me so pretty spread out so like we weren't super close growing up you know makes sense um but my brother who's the middle child was always listening to music like if he was sitting in his room he would be playing like fifa on his playstation listening to the grateful dead or whatever and you know how it is. I mean, I, I grew up kind of idolizing my older brother. I mean, I sure. I played basketball because my older brother played basketball. I played lacrosse all the way through, you know, up until college because my brother played lacrosse. Like everything, I kind of followed in. I stole his T-shirts out of his drawers. You know, I wanted to wore him to school. I wanted to be cool in middle school wearing a Grateful Dead shirt. Um, so, like, I, I was kind of always into music. But, like, the Beatles were definitely – my uncle exposed me to the Beatles – Okay. Pretty young. Um, and I think he, cause he's a musician. I, I think he saw something in me like that. I could, you know, sit at a piano and figure out a melody pretty early in my life. Um, and that kind of sparked my interest in like music in general. But then when I heard, this is a story I tell all the time, but like I was playing NBA jams in my buddy's bedroom and it was probably 1991. Mm-hmm. Um, and he put on Nirvana's Nevermind. And I was like, oh, this is really cool, you know. And then he said, I'll never forget this. He was like, oh, if you like that, you'll really like this. And he put on Pearl Jam's 10. Oh, yeah. And I got lost. I, I put the controller down and I just sat in front of his stereo. There was like six of us hanging out mm-hmm. playing. We, I think we were, we would always do like these tournaments. We were super nerdy. Like we would do like Street Fighter 2 tournaments and have brackets. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we did it with NFL Blitz was a fun one. That was oh, a great nice. one in, in the later 90s. Nice. Nice. That's super fun. I mean, I, I loved those moments. I had a really great childhood. I, I'm not going to. I mean, I had a lot of opportunity given to me. Yeah. As a white man, I will identify and, and you know, and, and basically just admit to that. I had a lot of opportunity because of that. Um, and I grew up in a really small town and I had a great neighborhood I grew up in. But at that moment in my life. That specific moment was the catalyst to launch me into playing guitar. I immediately went home and I told my parents, I, I want to play guitar. I want to get a guitar. And he let me take 10 home and I put 10 on my brother's stereo in his room. And I sat and listened to 10 twice all the way through. Wow. Didn't do anything else. I just sat on the carpet, listened to 10 twice through. I, mi- I miss those it. days when we did that kind of thing. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if we as a culture have left it or if it's just I and my friends that I know have left it. I don't just sit and listen. I listen while doing other things. I don't sit and just actively listen. Uh, now, I am an albums guy. I'm not a, I'm not a singles guy. I want to hear an album. I want to hear it start to finish. Um, but in fact, to this day, there are some of my favorite albums of all time that I couldn't name the songs on them. But I know what track three sounds like. (laughs) Right? Right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Especially if the lyrics are harder to understand. I I don't even know the the chorus because I have no idea what he's saying. But I love the music of it. A lot of the times you can't understand what that man is saying. Yeah, exactly. That's 100%. That's why I thought that was really (laughs) relevant. Uh, For a long time, like my favorite band of all time is the Black Crows. And my favorite album of all time is Southern Musical and Harmony Companion. Oh yeah, uh, Southern Harmony and Musical Companion. Oh, I get that backwards too in my head. But I know the titles of some of them. 
and I know the lyrics to most of them, but there's still songs that I have no idea what Chris Robinson is singing. Right. They're like I did nothing there makes sense to me, sir. But it totally. sounds great. It sounds great. So uh yeah, so I we left that behind, it feels like. Nobody I think it was uh it was just last year that Adele like went to Spotify because their default like you click an album in Spotify, the default play button used to be shuffle. Mm. And she was like, No, I put these songs in an order for a reason. Yeah. Have it start at the beginning. Yeah. I was like, at least somebody's paying attention to that now. I a hundred percent identify with it as a as a songwriter who writes and has released a lot of albums. It's like it's it's very intentional. Like it's calculated for sure. Like when I'm if there's gonna be eight songs on a record, like my last record, mm-hmm. I sat down and I was like, How is this gonna flow? Like, how do I want this to feel like as you take a journey through, you know, these 50 minutes of music, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I 100 percent identify with that. There is a purpose to it. Now, I will say too, releasing records is expensive. And like, I don't have a <laughs> yes. label. So I mean, like, you know, and that's why the last the last thing I put out was a single because I was like, if I'm going to put all this money into it. I'm going to do something big with it. So I, I, we went down my band. I took my band down to Nashville and we recorded the single in the Wood Brothers studio. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And John O. Uh, Ricks, the drummer from the Wood Brothers produced it. And it, it was, a it was an amazing experience. Like I, I will cherish that forever, but um, you know, that's the odd exception is like yeah, doing yeah. a single like that. But, you know, mostly, I mean, even like, dude, like just going back, like af- after I got the guitar and after I started shedding and taking lessons for a couple of years and working on my craft and then I started to discover songwriting because I was a big Paul McCartney fan, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward playing in the grunge era. I get into jam bands more in high school, listening to Fish and Mo and the Grateful Dead and all these groups. And then I start touring in a jam band up and down the coast um, all throughout college and stuff and in fact the band that i was touring with is now back together and we hadn't we hadn't released music in 20 years and we just got back together Um, that's awesome so we're doing that again um but that band toured extensively up and down the east coast opened up big festivals and all that stuff um so we're doing that again but ultimately you know my path led through doing that then you know getting married My wife was going to go to get her doctorate in Boston. And I was like, what the hell am I going to do in Boston? I don't know what I'm going to do. So I applied to Berkeley. She didn't get in. I got in. (laughs) And and I was like, do you want to move to Boston and have an adventure? And she's like, yes, I do. So we were we didn't have a kid at that point. Mm -hmm. We moved to Boston. I went to Berkeley and ended up getting a job with Berkeley, which I still have to this day, 13 years later. Um, And now I'm. And then when the pandemic hit and my gig shut down, because I was playing yeah. eight to 12 times a month, you know, oh, wow. playing live yeah, music. Busy. Yeah, I, I was real busy, man. Um, I was hustling hard. Um, it's, it, a lot in the beginning, it was a lot of out of necessity of monetary reasons, you know, with like sure. keeping the roof up and the food on the table. But, um, you know, as my wife started to like climb the ladder because she's a smarty. I didn't need to be as, you know, prolific with my gigs, still writing and, and, you know, recording and doing session work and all that stuff. But when the pandemic hit, man, I was like, I just hit a wall and I'm like, it feels like a part of me was ripped out, you know? So I was like, what can I do? And I was like, well, I like talking about music. I do it for my job already. Um, I thought I would do it once a month. And I, I hit up Joey Landreth, who's a, who's a friend, and was like, do you want to be my first guest? And he was like, yeah, man, let's do it. And I did it. And then I sent a bunch of emails out to all these people, Charlie Hunter, who I took lessons with before, and Ariel Posen. And, and they all said yes. And I was like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to do this at least once a week. <laughs> right? Because I sent out so many emails. and so, like, Because my connections were so – it was so cool because Berkeley offered me all these you know, ways to connect and, and weave a web. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, and that really did support me in getting my thing off the ground. And I, in the beginning, the first season, I did two a week, Philip. I did one wow. on like a Tuesday and then one Saturday morning every week for the first six to eight months of me doing a podcast. Yeah. And my and poor... That, that's how you ended up with this massive backlog of videos that's 
There's yeah. there's a ton. I was I was going through them trying to find some highlights and you know getting ready for this. I was like, let me go through and watch some of these again, or maybe some that I hadn't watched because you have a lot. I haven't watched all of them. Yeah, uh, of course. But yeah, I was like, this is a lot. Yeah, and it was a lot of work too, man. Like, oh yeah, you know how it goes. Like a lot of prep, a lot of like digging in, and luckily, like I'm a nerd enough that I am like super in the weeds with every artist that I love and whatever. But um. But poor Terry, who does my art, he he was like, dude, <laughs> we can't we can't do two anymore because he he does it out of the, the love in his heart. Like we're really good pals. And he was like, yeah. I want to help you. And um, and he continues to like each week, like I send him the picture. He does it. And I was like, are you sure you don't want me to like learn Photoshop and I can just take it over? He's like, no, I like being involved. So so he's I love him. Big shout out to Terry. He was he's been a big supporter. Um, awesome. So and that, and then, you know, and then we're sitting here like it's just basically I'm, I'm back to gigging um i'm back into the studio working on releasing new music and trying to do that i feel like i've been going to see more live music recently which has been amazing because i you know didn't for so many years my I have right. parents that are in their 80s dude i've i've been very careful during covid oh uh, yeah i don't I'm want gonna... me to be the reason one of them dies you know what i mean 100 that's heavy <laughs> it's, it, it is it's real heavy uh i actually I lost my mom during COVID and, oh, and not sorry, to be, man. not to be real heavy, but it wasn't too COVID, but I definitely did not see her very much in those last few months because I was afraid of that very thing. So yeah. it's, it's heavy. It's, it was a hard time. It was a real tough time. So I totally, totally. relate. Dude, a hundred percent. And like, all, I was telling my wife the other day, like all the music that I've written in the past year and a half or so has all been mental health lyrically related mm. and i'm like you know i used to write about silly stuff and i used to write about relationships and love and friendships and like all these different things um and uh i was like all these lyrics if i'm reflecting on this this, this must be an extremely healing time for me or i'm going through some arc you know if it's because i'm in my early 40s and i'm having a midlife crisis i don't know what it is but i feel like i'm writing the best lyrics i've ever written I'm writing the best melodies. I'm writing the best music I've ever written. So part of me feels like the pandemic kind of helped me step back and realize what's important and going to see live music more now. And like being inspired by that is also a very large part of my creative process. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings. I'm a snob, at least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where String Joy Strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. String Joy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coded strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy Strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy Strings today. Yeah, so. see, I I totally relate uh, in that I actually had had like my gigging had eased back even before the pandemic because I had moved. And so I didn't have my, you know, band near me. And, you know, most of my gigs were blues cover gigs or pickup gigs or, and that was fine. It would, to me, that was what I really enjoy doing. Uh, although I, I, I write not as much as I want to, I need, you know, like four more hours in the day. I keep saying, I need four yeah. more hours in the day to get everything done. Cause my day job keeps me very busy. Um, and, but I had already started to ease back on my gigging because of that. And then all the gigs vanished. And yeah. and then I, I battled like vocal problems and I'm still battling a little bit, but I finally found the cause of them earlier this year. And so Tell me about that. Tell me about that. I'm curious because I so, I've had a similar thing. Well, mine was well, I've always had just because I've always been an aggressive singer, not like in a like I don't know, like hardcore metal kind of way, but I'm right. just an aggressive singer and a loud singer. And I probably wasn't using the best technique and I probably drank more whiskey during gigs than I should. <laughs> so, you, you know what? All these things are adding up, right? Right. Um, but it actually turns out. So I used to be really into weightlifting 
uh, used to be really into, you know, I've always been a big guy and I'm fine with that. That's whatever. Um, uh, but like I got, you know, I played football in high school, was going to play football in college, but I shattered my ankle and just, you know, took up guitar instead. Actually, that's how I ended up playing a lot of guitar was I broke my ankle and was on crutches for three months. So what did I do? I sat in my dorm room or my bedroom at home and played guitar. Um, cause I had only taken guitar up, I don't know, about six or seven months before I broke my ankle. So, uh, so that, that, that was how I ended up down this road, but then, you know, got healthy, started working out again, just, you know, health bounced back and forth, but I stayed lifting and running and I got really into running in my last few years of college. Uh, even though I was never fast, I just really enjoyed distance running, I've run a couple of marathons at this point, a bunch of half marathons. Nice. Well, that's fine. And so the problem is that I've discovered recently, I have always used like supplements. Like when I was weightlifting, I would use things like creatine or protein powder and stuff like that. Um, and then when I did running or when I did more aerobic stuff, I used things like pre-workouts for the little energy boost and, and whatnot. It turns out, as I've discovered early this year, I have an allergy to certain pre-workouts. Wow. And that was what was shredding my voice. Dang. Yeah, it, it took it took finally doing a whole process of elimination thing to, to weeding things out of my diet and my um, just daily life before I figured out what it was. Wow. And that was what it was. And so... I discovered that in late December or right at the beginning of January when I got like severe vocal pain. Mm, Actually, man. it is part of I went through a longer I, I always I tend to take a break in the last part of December for the podcasting. I say tend to now I'm in my third year, so two times. Mm -hmm. um, but I take a break in late December, try to get started back in January. I had to take a longer break in January than I wanted to because I was literally in pain wow. to talk. So. I don't know. I'm about 65% now, 70%, which is really way better than I was. So yeah. I'm hoping to start gigging again. But yeah, not having those gigs in my life, man, that was a rough, that's a rough spot. My, yeah. my, my wife knows. She's like, no, 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 you need to play music because you're a terrible person when you're not. <laughs> yeah, I know that story. <laughs> you're, you're an awful person when you're not. So working on that, working on gigging more trying to write more. That's a big deal to me. Like I've also discovered I'm not a good solo writer. Mm. Um, I'm just not, I can start some things, but they're just going to sit there as fragments unless I sit down with somebody else and like, help me flesh this out, like, yeah. or give me an idea and then I can flesh it out. Like I, I can't do the solo write thing very well. I, I have just a handful of songs out of the hundreds of partial songs I've written. Right. That I, that I actually have held on to, but just trying to get back in it, just like you, you know, just trying to find a way back in it. But I am in, I'm in, I don't want to call it musical desert because it's really not, but it is, I'm in a small town in East Mississippi, like going to gigs isn't as much of an option unless I want to go hear the same three country cover bands that play at the bar downtown, <laughs> you know, and uh -huh. I, I just don't, I, I don't need to hear Wagon Wheel that bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. Yeah, so, man. uh. But yeah, that's that has been a focus of mine too. Going to see more live music, mm -hmm. and and it's so important it is. It's, it's such a big deal. Yeah, and and people take it for granted. And I I I think there's a lot of people who might think, well, I don't take it for granted anymore because like COVID made me realize. And I'm like, are you going to see music? Like, exactly. When was the last time you saw it? Then right. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, I guess because it it's gonna be gone. It's gonna mm -hmm. be gone. At least, at least the accessible stuff will be gone. There'll still be arena tours, and there'll still be whatever. I don't want to. I think I'm in minority, but I hate arena shows. Mm -hmm. Just don't like them. I, I don't want to go sit. The last arena show I went to, uh, Kelly and I went to see Red Hot Chili Peppers at the FedEx Forum in like twenty. 16 maybe oh, wow. 2015 I don't, I don't remember um and after that i was like i don't want to do arena shows anymore i don't there's no band i want to see that bad to sit in a crowd of 40,000 people 30,000 people yeah and watch this and and have would have had as good or better an experience watching it on a good set of speakers at home yeah that's the thing that's the thing man i i mean i think there's validity in that i i uh I mean, I, I'll always go see Pearl Jam at a, at a, at a arena <laughs> yeah. because I love that band so much. But um, 
but yeah, I mean, I prefer smaller theaters and, you know, usually more intimate settings for these Mm -hmm. gigs that I go to. Um, A lot of the times, like some of the stuff that I've gone to, I went to see the band Mo twice in one month, like in a 30 day period, they played New Year's Eve and in Philly, which is only about an hour and a half for me. Mm -hmm. And then they played in DC, which is only about an hour and a half for me, like a month later. Um, And both of those were, you know, small rooms. Like you're talking, I don't know. It was like 2,500 people, maybe 3000 people at the most. Um, And dude, New Year's Eve was crazy. Cause we were, I was walking (laughs) in with my buddy and they, they had like a pat down. Like they had like police force. Like, I don't know who, what company was contracted to do this, but like, I got patted down like I was getting like about to get a cavity search, dude. <laughs> like this dude, and, and like when you walked up, the the every I heard all of them saying it. There was like ten of them, and there was like ten lines going into this venue. And the guy, I was like, okay, that guy seems like he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. He seems like he's keeping everybody safe. I'm gonna go to him. Um, and he was like, "Are you ready?" And I was like, yeah, "I guess, yes." And he was like, "Put your arms out." Boom, 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 like super quick up and down my legs. And then he grabbed my belt and like yoinked me up. And I was like, <laughs> dude, just picked me up off the ground and gave me like a Melvin, like nobody's business. <laughs> and uh, and I was appreciative. Like I like after I walked through there, I was like, thank you. Because I'm like, now nah, I don't have to worry about, you know, the, the crap that we have to worry about these days. with someone right. being crazy and coming in with a gun or whatever. Yeah. Um, But I, I was like legitimately – very happy to go through that process. Um, when just, in reality, they weren't looking for guns. They were just checking to make sure no one in the audience had a harmonica. That was all they were really <laughs> checking for. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Once, I don't know. Back when I worked at uh, a blues club, uh, there was a, an artist that came through that actually had it in their rider that no one in the audience may have a harmonica. Like, it's that big an issue at blues shows. That's so funny, There's dude. nothing worse than the audience harmonica player. <laughs> that is very very true i've experienced that and maybe i need to like rethink that whole thing when i go to a gig yeah uh, i had somebody my bass player last time we were playing at this club in baltimore he was like hey my buddy plays harmonic i was like i'm gonna stop you there uh-huh. Done. <laughs> I was like, nope unless it's john popper no thank you i like, i have i have a handful of course i'm i'm from clarksdale mississippi so like blues mecca right i have a list of less than 10 harmonica players that okay they can come play right and and a couple of them are way too big to ever actually play with me like i know i i i'm very blessed to have like had a sit down conversation with like charlie musclewhite right like i don't know who that is Is oh so charlie musclewhite is like uh it's like i'm not gonna go into his his big time history we uh listener if you're not familiar with charlie musclewhite Please Google, please check him out. Multi Grammy award winner, like oh, hardcore snap. blues royalty at this point. Um, but yeah, like Charlie, uh, there's a guy in Clarkson named Deke Harp. Uh, Harp is obviously not his last real last name, but right. Deke, uh, there's, you know, there, there are these guys I know. Um, then I'm like, no, 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 they can come play with me. But like random guy off the street playing harmonica, uh, mm mm. Mm-hmm. no not gonna work right when harmonica's played well it's an incredible instrument oh, yeah. but it, when it is played badly it's like a three-year-old with a violin right and it's and awful no shade to like you know neil young because neil young's a great harmonica player but like he he's not like a you know picking the right notes out using his tongue and like doing the thing like no no he's bob he, dylan in it you know it's like it's yeah. that kind of thing he's playing um, harmonica he's not playing harp Right. And that's the thing, too, is like when you see those cats roll in um, and if you see somebody roll in with like a, you know, a tweed, like a small tweed, like a champ and like a bullet mic or something cool. I'm like, all right, this cat knows what he's doing. Like, or at least they know the right tools. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We're we're halfway there. (laughs) Yeah. But I, yeah, I can see that. But now here's the thing, though. Like, I will always if I have a friend who says, hey, there's this killing, you know, tenor player, this alto player. Yes, I'm like, for sure, they are welcome to come up and sit in trumpet. I'm always leery about because trumpet is an instrument that it's very hard unless you're like Benny from Lettuce or you're like one of these cats that just blows his his Mm -hmm. butt off. Like it's a 
it's a tough instrument. It's not palpable like a sax is, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, um, it, it, there's a smoothness to saxophone. Even when it's played ag- aggressively, there's mm-hmm. a smoothness to it. Now, I will say with trumpet, if a guy walks up with a trumpet and they've also got a mute yeah. with them, they're going to play. We're, right. we're going to get, <laughs> once again, you brought the right tools. You know, right. you know how this works. Yeah, so totally, dude. We're halfway it's, there. Yeah. I, I, I used to host a jam at Ground Zero Blues Club, the blues club that I worked at for years. And I used to host a weekly jam. And you start to learn the signs. You you see the players. You and then someone once asked me, they're like, How do you how do you get these players who've never even met each other up and piece them together to to make a you know cohesive, you know, decent musical experience? I said, because you do this long enough. You realize who you can mix to make this work. You're right. like, y- you can tell almost immediately when someone gets on stage if they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. If they if they're comfortable, hey, um, the this guitar player, or, or especially if it's a drummer gets on stage and they feel super, co- I can tell they're super comfortable. I'm like, oh, we can make almost anything work here. I can, oh, yeah. I can get, I can get a lot of first time players up for this. Or if the drummer's not very comfortable, I know that I've got to get the most rock solid bass player that's in the place. Mm-hmm. Somebody's got to hold this down. And yep. so it's, you start to learn to piece those things. So you learn to recognize the signs of the confident, uh, competent players. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, 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 it's a weird skill to have, right? It's a mm-hmm. weird skill. Yeah. That's, you know, that's musical maturity. That's getting to know music period yeah um you know and people too i guess but yeah the drummer thing is uh man it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to find somebody that can work with you constantly because if they're good they're gonna be so busy yes you know what i mean it's like i've got a couple guys that i use and one guy in particular that i i love playing with him so much but he's in a band here that just when when festival season starts kicking off he's not available yep that's that's one of my guys that that I that he was the drummer in my first one. I decided I wanted to play as a trio and I was so spoiled to have him as my drummer in a trio because I normally you get in a trio and you become a better guitar player because you have to fill so much sonic space. I did not. Mm-hmm. I, well, I, I became a better in a lot of other ways, but like he filled so much space without ever being too much and he held a groove like nobody's business. Uh, I still think he's top three drummers i've ever played with he's probably number one but i'm trying to not just be definitive and trying to right. leave room for some people but <laughs> but um i got real lucky uh a fraternity brother of mine who's a, a drummer just moved back in state so i'm like nope d- nope nope i'm locking you down don't don't join any other bands you don't have time <laughs> i'm gonna try to make sure you don't have time so <laughs> nice nice Pin them down, man. Exactly. Yeah, it's tough. Like playing with a good rhythm section. I mean, because that's what I do here. I've, I mean, I well, the the other band, the jam band I play with is a five piece, but my Mark Hopkins and the Pretty War is my band. Mm-hmm. And that's a power trio. Um, yep. But I also play keys in that band. So I get to kind of float back and forth between guitar and keys. But it's man, when you when you get a good rhythm section, there is nothing that you can't do as a trio. Nothing. That's it. Nothing. You can you can go anywhere. You mm-hmm. can. It, there's so much harmonic ground, and, and especially like uh, if you've got a bassist who understands harmony and holds things down, and like because there's so much freedom to roam. And that's what I got in that trio that I played in because I'm playing with a bunch of guys who grew up playing in like church. I don't mean they played in church. I mean they played in church. Right, right, right. Like right, right. that's what. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Those kinds of yeah. players. Like mm-hmm. the whole service is music, and it's all improv. So they're improving for like two hours straight. That's the players I played with. And so I, I I was exploring jazz and jam band stuff and all sorts of stuff during that time in that, in that with trio and they would just lock it down and I could explore sonic space and go anywhere I wanted. And they would always still be at home and I'd be able to come back. Yeah. It's it's weird. It's a weird thing. You think it's easy. Like somebody would think, oh, it's really easy for a bassist just hold a groove and not go anywhere. No, no, no. I played with so many bassists who you start to explore harmonic territory. They start trying to follow you. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't, no, don't do no, 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 no. Yeah. I need you to I need you to be home base. Yeah. Because I'm not gonna be. <laughs> yeah. Totally, dude. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I mean, as long as the rhythm section, as long as you know where the one is, we good. Exactly. Like, That's it. You know, it's it's definitely a hard thing. I've played with some cats where 
you know, you have to feel like you're the band leader and it's exhausting. It's, it's emotionally exhausting, physically exhausting and aurally exhausting. Um, and I think that sometimes when you get into that headspace, that's why I like, there's a couple cats that when I play with them, man, I get, I'm so excited leaving the house. I'm like, I'm going to get home so darn late. I'm going to be walking <laughs> in the door at like 3 a.m., but I don't even mm-hmm. care. Like, I got to get up at 6 to get my kid out the door for school or whatever it is. But I can care less because I'm, my endorphins are going to be pumping so hard. The dopamine is going to be pumping and keeping me awake enough to get home, and then I'm going to crash hard. Yep. Um, but it, it's it's so beautiful. Like, there's been times where, you know, you you lose sight of that. You play with, you know – a rotating cast of people on the gig before you're like, oh, that, was, that was a, it was an okay gig. Right. And then you show up for the next one and you got the, the two cats that you want to be playing with and everything goes right because they're seasoned players. They're people exactly. that like know what's going on and they know you musically well enough that if I'm doing some sweetly, sweetly, they know exactly where I'm going. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. you know, exactly. Like I, I don't even have to, it's like telepathy, you know? Yep. Um, and I love that. In those moments when that stuff happens, it, it's just, there's nothing like it. Like I could never explain, my wife will never understand what that feeling is like. Um, and, and I always say this, but it's akin to, and I'm not trying to downplay war, obviously, but like, it's right. like being in a foxhole with, you know, a, a fellow soldier and going through something together. And this, like, this music is nowhere near to that terrible. No, no, no. But... It's once you go through that, I mean, that's why my band is called Mark Hopkins and the Pretty War. Because like every time you get on stage, it could be a disaster. It could be a beautiful, even if it is a disaster, it could be a beautiful moment, you know? Right. Um, so it, it, it's just, I love the danger of music, especially improvisational music, which is why I gravitate towards it. Because it's like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and you're just on your heels and your toes are over the edge, like the whole time. I want to, I want that feeling. I want to feel like this could fall apart at any minute, at any minute. And I'm going to have to figure out a way to make it work. I like that. That is, that is my favorite part. That is, that is, I, I am also very steeped in improvisational music. Um, to the point that I, it's probably been a detriment to me learning songs and learning parts and like learning the way a song is played because I don't care. Right. I, I, I don't <laughs> yeah. care. I don't yeah. care how it was done on the record. I don't, you know, I want to take the essence of that song mm-hmm. and I want to just play. And I want to figure to this point that like the, the whole thing about, you know, what each other's going to do. I have whole like songs that I cover, I do a very specific way. And most of those ways were born out of those happy chaotic accidents Mm -hmm. with that trio. And I've had moments where now that's just how I play that song. Like if you go come hear me play, like we do, we do some covers. Like I'm just, I'm going to throw some covers out there because like blues cover gig, there's some standards you expect. Like we do superstition, you Mm -hmm. know, that's a, that's a standard. I I do it in a way that's not normal. Like right. most of the song is normal, but there are some transitions. Like I'm going to transition in some weird places. There's there's no explaining that transition to someone. There's just mm-hmm. doing it. Totally. And it's I, I have had so much trouble getting drummers to get these transitions that just came naturally to to the band I was playing with before. And or I do um Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone by Bill Withers, which is one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, it's very, if, if you think I'm going to play it, the, Bill Withers is, is real up and down. There's not a lot of swing or, or rubato or movement mm-hmm. in his version. There's a ton in mine. It moves and it breathes a little differently. Yeah, and so if you come into my band and you expect me to play this, you know, straight up and down the way, the way it is on the record – you're you're done. We're we're we can't do this. That's right. why I get picky. I'm so picky about drummers. Yeah. Man. Um yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other thing about drums. And I wish I could play drums. I I've I've actually done a couple of gigs on drums and I tell people that I am I am a literal last call drummer. <laughs> um, literal. <laughs> get and, off and the that, bench, folks. Yeah, that means you can't cancel. Like you tried to cancel first. Right. <laughs> you don't come to you don't come to me and say if you don't play we'll have to cancel. No, no, no. 
we couldn't cancel, so please come play drums. Yes. <laughs> that's yes. that's where I am. Save the um, day, put your cape on, Brosif. Exactly. That's yeah. that's just the way that is. But I, I love that chaotic feeling of of I don't I don't know how we got where we are now in in a song. And then you're in that, okay, how do I get back? Like how do we rein this? I, I love that. And actually one of the greatest compliments I've ever received. Completely unearned. I'm, just, I'm gonna go ahead and say that this at the top. But as a friend of mine whose opinion on musicality I really respected was was at a gig I was at. He said, you know, he said, your playing really reminds me sometimes of Jeff Beck and who Jeff Beck's like was a massive hero to me playing. And like, I'm still bummed that I'm never going to get the chance to see him live. You know, that was like, I never got a chance to do it. Um, But I don't play anything like Jeff Beck. I'm just going to throw that out there. Not (laughs) not even in, I don't, I don't play the same sport, let alone in the same ballpark. Right. Um, But he said, there's this edge of chaos, this edge of things falling apart, this urgency that gets into your playing when you're really in it. And he said, that's what reminds me of Jeff Beck's playing. I was like, that was best compliment. Yeah, the second, second best compliment I've ever received. And so we're going to, we're going to stop there. <laughs> done. It's like, uh, I mean, are, are you into like jazz fusion stuff at all? Like, do you listen to uh, jazz fusion stuff? I, I listen to some of it. I've tried to get into it. So when I was at, I was in college for music, I have an, my undergrads in music. Um, and you know, my school didn't really have a guitar program. So I'm like the guitar player in the the college, the, the small whole, college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like the guitar player. In fact, I went back recently. We, they do this like fundraising event, uh, for the alumni associations. I think it's for the alumni association. It's a big band bash. And so there's like this big massive band. They did an alumni one. So a bunch of the alumni came back and we're doing all these, you know, classic Benny Goodman swing tunes. Right. And, um, I'm going through the folder of tunes they prepared, and I'm like, uh, Brett Pimentel, Dr. Brett Pimentel, who's the the jazz professor there. And I was like, Brett, I think, I think these are still my notes on this tune mm. from the you know when I was in school here forever ago, like 13 years ago. Uh, I went to I went to school later in life because I I dropped out, then I worked for a while, then I went back to college. Right, I can dig it. So I graduated in 2010. Um, at the ripe old age of 29. So y'all can do the math if you want to figure out how old I am. Um, but uh, so went back last year. So 12 years since I'd been in the jazz band, at least for some of these tunes. So longer for some of them. And he was like, yeah, you were the last guitar player we had in jazz band. Really? <laughs> yeah, that, it's just not. Well, the school opened up a um, audio engineering and recording, a, a recording industry management kind of program. Uh... And so all the guitar players migrated to that and none of them do the music major path so none of them join those bands because they've got a a a classic rock band and a jazz band and not a jazz band a a blues band and some other stuff so they all play over there nobody he says occasionally we'll have someone audition for the jazz band but like they've never seen a major nine let alone like a a six nine or a major minor seven or anything like that you know a minor major seven but um he's like yeah nobody you know Anyway, I, I digress. It's just that. So, so we did that gig, and I really enjoyed playing that stuff. And I actually forgotten how I got to this point. Weird. I was asking you about uh, jazz fusion. Oh yeah. You, so, so to- when I was in school, I tried to learn, like at least get a taste of all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is, I hit hard bop and just fell in love. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, blues player, hard bop's kind of a blues player's jazz, um, right? And so, but I, I spent, you were t- we were talking about how you listen to albums. So I spent two weeks listening to Bitches Brew by Miles Davis yeah. because I knew how important that album was in the creation of, you know, fusion. And I, I knew that it was a big deal. John McLaughlin plays on that record. And um, I was like, I've got to listen to this because like, I want to understand and then I listened to it and I was like, no, I, I really want to understand. So I listened to it again <laughs> and I listened to that album for two weeks until it made sense to me. Right. And like I figured it out. I, I say figured it out. I understood why the appeal was there. And and for those of you listeners that have never listened to it, I challenge you, go listen to the entirety of Bitches Brew. <laughs> go listen to it. 
and I, I, I hate that I'm gonna have to put an explicit tag on this episode just for the name of an album, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't care. Um, uh, go listen to that album because, and I'm going to give you the cheat sheet. The cool thing about that album is there is a running narrative through the entire album. There's, there's in each song, but then there's one throughout the entire album. And that the storyteller of that narrative changes instruments all the time. Mm. Sometimes the thread that's holding the story together in the chaos that is that album is the drummer. Right. So, and I don't mean that he's holding a rhythm. I mean, he's doing, it's almost linear drumming at certain points. And he's, um, he's holding the narrative or maybe it's in the bass or maybe it's in the guitar or sometimes it's in the melody, but there is a, there's a running narrative that passes narrators throughout the entire album. And it took me two weeks to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heavy record, man. And honestly, like, uh, hats off to you for taking the time to do it. Cause that, that record never resonated with me. I was never like, Oh, I love this. Like, Oh, and- I still don't love it. I still don't. Love- yeah. <laughs> I mean, Miles, I mean, you know, there's some stuff that I love listening to like that's, you know, Miles music. But, um, you know, I, I think for me, besides Coltrane, like listening to Coltrane mm-hmm. or or listening to Bill Evans, like I don't. Yes. I really kind of identify more with guitar players like John Schofield or, you know, Wayne Krantz is a huge influence on me. Like right. a gigantic influence on me. Like if people listen to me play guitar and then like listen to Wayne Krantz. They're like, Oh, I see what you're doing. Like, I see the stuff <laughs> you're stealing. I see the stuff that, you know, and like I unabashedly like, yes. Like, and the main thing that I think that I steal from Wayne and every guitar player steals from other people, other guitar players, yeah. you know, to find your, your fingerprint. But like, I, I try to create rhythmic melody. Okay. I, I don't rely all the time on melodic melody. I rely on I'm very into rhythmic patterns and odd polyrhythms and and stuff like that. So like when I'm soloing, a lot of the times I might just pick two or three notes or four notes and I might create a weird, odd rhythmic pattern with those notes instead of, you know, playing some searing, you know, melt your face solo. Now, not all night, but there might be two songs a night where I do this very, very heavily. Right. Um, You know, and, and. to me, I like that attack because it, it it feels like a swarm of bees on stage. And I kind of like those little and in like I said, not all night, but I like having a couple moments in each gig that are going to leave people breathless because there's so much rhythm going on between drummer and the bass player and me. You know, whatever is going on, you know, like. Whatever it is, I want it to be like, what just happened? <laughs> it's a, well, it's a tension and release. It's the same <coughs> thing they teach you in music school. It's like you're building that tension. And I love things like that. I, I do something similarly, but I learned it from a totally different place. You know, I learned it from blues players who would do the repeated phrase thing. And mm. and blues players, a lot of time, if you really like, if you, for you, for you, a hardcore um, musos that want to, you know, you, you guys are like the the notating people, and you want to actually understand solos. If you're not one of those people, that's fine. It, I get it. I totally get it. Um, <laughs> but if you really <laughs> trust me, but if you like really dive into the way some of these blues players play, they're they're outside rhythm and time. They're outside of harmony, like a fifteen percent of the time. Like you, you can't put it in your nice little neat notation. Like right. we had to invent notation to be able to write down blues music. Um, but like some of them hit these phrases and do that same thing you're talking about. Like, okay, you're, you're in four or maybe you're in 12, eight or whatever you're in. And you hit, instead you hit a lick that's almost in five. And mm. now you've got to sit there for a certain number of measures. I'm not going to do the math y'all in the <laughs> library. I'm not a <laughs> mathematician. To loop around. Yeah. For it to loop around. And so it's going to be tense until that resolve comes back around and it builds mm-hmm. that tension and then release. And I love that. It's, it's again, that chaos that, that feels so good. It feels good because it resolves. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I, I you know, who I, I learned also learned that from very heavily because <clears throat> I do play drums as well, uh-huh. but Vinny Caliuta, if you listen to Sting's um, record, 10 Summoner's Tales, I've heard that one, but I need to now. Oh, man. 
Uh, Vinny Caliuta plays drums. I believe on that whole record. I could be wrong, but I think he plays drums on that whole record. But there are tunes on that where he is playing in five or he's playing in seven, but he's he's rapping it. He's rapping oh. the beat. So it's like, what's a good example? Um, there's a song in five. It's called Seven Days. It's funny because it's in five. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like the groove is like, boom, bump, boom, bump. But way the way that Vinny's playing with it, the beat is kind of coming back around and it's rapping. It's not like a squared off thing. Yeah. Um, and and I think that's another cue I took from listening to music, like listening to albums like we were talking about is like, mm -hmm. what can I take from not the guitar player and not from Sting? Like, what is the drummer doing? And like, yeah. why is that interesting? Like. That's something that I think a lot of musicians are are wackadoo about. Like we all like analyze stuff way too much. Um, I don't have perfect pitch, but I can imagine someone who has perfect pitch at a show. That must be the most annoying thing. If there's something, <laughs> somebody's out of tune or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Um, but what is beautiful about analyzing stuff is, is like, don't just pay attention to the instrument that you play. You have something to learn from every single person that is in that record, you know? Yep. Um, and I, and I treat a lot of the music that I consume in that sense. Like if I hear, cause most of the time, like I don't gravitate towards guitars. I gravitate towards the drummer a lot. Yeah. Um, and if there's a groove that feels good, like I could listen to, um, like the meters all day on repeat just because of Ziggy. Like I could listen to that groove all day. Like I could listen to Robert Palmer sneaking Sally through the alley on repeat. Yes. All day I, and be happy. I actually you know? on on Saturday I had to drive to a gig and it was a it was a pretty decent distance. And the whole way all I did was listen to the very best of the meters on repeat. It's what an incredible record. Yeah. I it's, mean there's so much music and there's so there's there's depth to the to that music that people kind of surface layer don't really identify. Yeah. Oh, um, every everybody so. covers Sissy Strut, but when but like and and I cover Sissy Strut just like everybody else. But then listening to it on that trip, I was listening to it almost for the first time again. I was like, because I'd gotten so used to, oh, I play this song, I know this song. No, I was listening to it again. I don't know this song, right? I, it's right. It's like, oh yeah, you know the melody, you know the chords. When was the last time you really listened to this song? And, and got heard, inside it. Yeah. You know? and, and heard all the things that you never do because you didn't hear them when you were learning it. Mm -hmm. Now you've played it for a little while. You go back and listen to it. You're like, oh, there's an accent I was missing. Or, oh, and, and sometimes it's as quantifiable as, you know, oh, he clips this note short where I'm sustaining it longer and I really shouldn't because I'm losing something. Or sometimes you're like, uh, I remember the first time I realized that Hotel California had a reggae beat. Right. Um, you <laughs> yeah. know, yep. I thought I knew that song until I was like, "Shit, it's a reggae song." Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, I yeah, I know, I know. It, and and if you listen to the meters, like really listen to the meters, and you listen to a song like people say, like mm -hmm. there there's just so much going on in that tune. Um, and that, like, listening to the meters is a rhythm guitar player's doctrine. Yeah. It just is. And, you know, we don't even play the Sissy Strut, like the meters version. We play, Sco like, Schofield's version, where yeah, yeah. He, he modulates the A flat in the B section, which, because I just love it. It's super nerdy. Um, but it, there's just so much that we can all take from that music. I mean, I, dude, I listen to so many different styles of music. I'm going on the radio to do this thing where I'm taking over this radio station for an hour and playing music that I'm currently listening to. And I'm getting interviewed about like what's oh, that's going rad. on. And, um, I was coming up with the list of songs and stuff. And I was like, Holy crap, this is all over the place. Like there's just so many different bands and so many different styles of music. I mean, I went back to pull a Matthew sweet song out. I went back and pulled, there's this Canadian band that not a lot of people know about called I mother earth. And they put this record out in 1996 that is one of the most forward thinking rock records. It's almost like there was, they were like a rock band, a Canadian jam rock band. 
Like yeah, before I'm... Umphreys McGee was doing what they do. Oh, kind of wow. Thing. So um, like uh, viewers, you know that my face, uh, I was pulling up my phone so I can pull them up and listen to them later. So yeah. here's the thing. I Am on the Earth's record, their first record is called Dig, um, and mm -hmm. it was okay. The album that I'm referring to is called Scenery and Fish, and it is hard to find. Okay. It's like out of print. I can send it to you. I can Dropbox it to you. I just sent yeah, it to Josh Scott, hear it. actually, because we were talking nice. about it. Um, but, it, dude, that record, every song on that record I love. And it's heavy. There's some heavy sounding, like, guitars and, like, that, like, really, like, heavy, distorted bass sound. But then there's these beautiful, soft moments, the dynamics that that band achieves on that record, the jams in the middle. Like, I'm trying to reach out to Jag, who's the guitar player, because he and his brother are, like, the main guys, songwriters in that band. Yeah. And I want to hear how they recorded that record because several of the songs have a jam in the middle of the song for like, I'm talking like the jam is two minutes. Wow. Yeah. That's, and, that's a know, whole pop song in today's standards. 1996, <laughs> 1996. <laughs> and this album was all over the place in 96 and 97 when I was yeah. listening to it. Um, and it's just like stuff like that, that I'm just like, I love, I literally love everything and, and want to take away from every little bit I can learn. Like, I hate when I go to shows with friends who play guitar, we go see Derek Trucks and like, well, I'm going to burn all my stuff. I'm like, that's the dumbest comment. Uh, it's like, yeah, no, it doesn't make any sense. Oh my God. Like, dude, like if anything, you should be like, wow, what can I learn from this? Like, I don't ever want to hear anyone say that because Okay, so yeah, I'm never going to be Derek Trucks. I don't want to yeah. be Derek Trucks. There's already a Derek Trucks. But when That's I play right. slide guitar, I want to get his feel. He has a like most of what Derek has is feel. Yep. His intonation and his feel are are Derek Trucks. It's it's that intonation that always gets me. And yeah. and I'm going to I'm going to go on a little bit of a Derek Truck talk here a little <laughs> bit because it's it's been a whole thing it, over in our Discord server. We've talked about Derek Trucks a lot recently. Uh, I'm a big Super Reverb fan. That was before I knew about Derek Trucks playing them. And then he just solidified that it's the greatest amp ever made. Um, <laughs> and then we've got a bunch of listeners. Kyle, I'm looking at you. Kyle, just uh, one of my Patreon, actually my very first ever Patreon supporter. He just bought a uh, Derek Trucks Signature SG. He's a massive fan. Actually, a couple of days ago, as of this recording, he went and saw uh, Tedeschi Trucks Live. But with Derek... um. A lot of slide players, I'm looking at me, I'm actually literally looking at my camera, looking at me, <laughs> um, really rely on vibrato to to really get feel and to know what you're doing, right? To really make it fit, to make that slide sound and to get that feel. Derek doesn't even need vibrato. His intonation is so precise. Mm -hmm. He can just hit a note. As if he were fretting it by hand. Yep. And it it freaks me out when I try to learn Derek Truck slide licks because his intonation is so perfect. Yep. Um, dude, I've I, worked so hard on that for I've been playing slide seriously and probably since 2015 since I met Joey. Um, uh huh. And really have worked very hard, even to the point where, dude, I've gone through. I'm actually good. I'm good about to do like in in May. I'm doing a slide clinic. Oh, and, nice! And it's all going to be about like, do not let it, you know, um, derail your love of wanting to learn it. Because a lot of people, what they do is they get in the headspace where they put a slide on their finger. The slide doesn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. I can't get it to sound right. Why is it buzzing now? Like, well, there's a bunch of stuff we can uncover and unwrap right there, buddy. Like, you got the wrong slide. Your action's too low. You might have been using the wrong gauge of string. Like, yeah, there is so many things like that. You're maybe kind of putting up a blockade in front of you that you're 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 starving yourself of the joy of learning and taking the journey. And I, dude, I I play an open C, and yeah, same. Same. Yeah, the, and the Joey Open C, not the other Open C, because there's two Open Cs. Yeah, the Joey. I had to, I had to learn that, um, because I would talk to people about Open C, and they're like, "Oh, you mean this tuning?" I was like, "Oh, no, that's no, no, no. Open E down two whole steps." Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One five one three five one. Exactly. Um, 
And I, I think that for me, I started in Open E. I actually bought a Derek signature SG. Oh, did I, you? I, I first bought an Epiphone to see if I liked an SG shape and how it felt on my body and everything. Yeah. And I was like, okay, like I'm I'm getting to the point where I can play enough slide. I can get around on the fretboard that I think I can transition, get a nicer guitar. So I did. I eventually sold that. Um, <laughs> but because uh, I'm a Strat guy at heart, but. But really, man, I, like, I knew we I knew we'd deviate somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> just found it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it really is kind of like getting over that hump as a slide player. Like you've got to find the right slide. I highly recommend checking out Rock Slides. They're they're really great. Yep, totally. That's Joey's signature. Well, actually, this I tried the Joey Landreth signature. I have a picture. Uh, maybe I'll remember to post it somewhere. This is actually their medium of the same style, mm -hmm. but the Joey, I just have big hands, uh, okay. and the Joey slide stopped at this knuckle on my pinky, <laughs> and I was yeah. like, that's not going to work, so I had to go up to the medium to get the fit that I wanted. Okay. So Okay. See, I yeah, switched. I actually, I actually Facebook messaged them and sent them a picture of it on my hand, and they were like, yeah, that's not going to work, so we recommend this size. So. That's good. Yeah, they're awesome. Their their customer service is great, too. It was um, really good. But, like, get a, get a bunch of slides. Like, I mean, you know, like, I prefer brass now, because if I drop it, mm -hmm. it won't break, <laughs> mostly. Yeah. Um, but I bought Derek's signature slide, the big course eating bottle thing that they put oh, out. Oh, yeah. Too big. Way too big. Yeah, yeah, I can't do that. Way too big. But I use I primarily use REL slide now with the ball tip. Um, you know that's one like I've it. been wanting to try. I've been really wanting to try that one. Um, I am a. Uh, I I need to just order one. It's not like they're expensive. It's a slide. No. Yeah, yeah, it's like. But I was like, I love I love any time I get to talking about slides. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share the Let's ridiculous slide collection here. Um, so I've got the you know the actual end of a bottle that somebody cut for me. Nice. We have a we have a, a local guy here in Mississippi who makes um what does he call them? I can't remember what he calls them, but like he puts them in a lot of the music stores here in Mississippi. He literally, you know, cuts bottles and and puts them out That's there. That's awesome. But then I've got like, you know, the three different sizes of glass. Yeah. <laughs> I've you got, got to. You gotta go through all I've got that one that back when back when I was a ring finger player. Mm -hmm. um, I've got this one, the Dunlop. I think these are both Dunlop, actually. They're just different gauges of Dunlop. Yeah. Um, there's this one, which is actually cut from a piece of pipe that a blues player made for me. Nice. Um, uh, this is the most ridiculous slide I have. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had one kind of that shape, too. It was made of bone. Oh, yeah. Same company, I think. I think it's the exact same company. This is the most useless slide I've ever... It was a gift. I've, it, hey, you play guitar. This would be really fun. No, yeah. it's not. Um, this is this is maybe... I don't use this anymore, but I used this one for a long time. This is... is chrome? Actually, this... It, do you remember the old, like... Yeah, we're about the same age. Do so you remember when you were a little kid? Mm -hmm. And you'd go over to your grandparents house and they had the little folding table they'd put out as the kids table mm -hmm. at thanksgiving dinner this was cut from one of those legs <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's it's like, awesome yeah this is cut from an old like folding table leg and i love it's super light which i don't like as much anymore but right. um i liked something light there and then uh my fa this this was my favorite until I, I broke it obviously i'm not putting that on my finger anymore but oh man um this uh, a buddy of mine from Japan, uh, who comes to the Mississippi Delta every year, cut this for me, and um, he had written he 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 started calling me and y'all this is I did not call myself this so there's no ego here he <laughs> called me this he he would always call me expert like guitar player like right, expert right, guitar right. player I was like I'm not whatever but he's super nice I love it. his name's Ey and um but yeah he wrote in Japanese the word for expert on the side of it. Oh, that's cool. In in whiteout, so it's starting to fade. But uh, yeah, like the slide thing. I've been. This was my journey into slide, and then I stopped at the rock slide. This yep. is the only one I use. So just jump there, folks. Because yeah, just go are, there. Go straight they're good. there. They're good. I like how like I like the cutout so you can bend your finger. I like the little <laughs> divot so you can kind of. Although I play slide pretty weird. I um, 
my ring finger sits on top of the slide and I mute with my middle and my first finger behind the slide. Let me see. Let me see how I do it. Um, so yeah, I do the same thing. Yeah, I do it like that. Where's my, yeah, I can't, why do I have, I have all my, my stuff's all over the place, man. Well, I have, (laughs) I I have Joey's here. So, um, so when I, when I play, my finger's actually on top. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even more than mine. Wow. I mute with these. So what I yeah. actually do is I turn – I want to actually talk to Rock Slide about doing one for me like that's custom so I can uh-huh. still have this cutout, but I yeah, can but put the... the divot on top. So the cutout would be here, and my finger can sit in that divot on top. Like yeah, that. I so, can see that. Yeah, so that's how I use – that's how I play slide. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I can't do it. I, I it t- it took a actually we'll we'll blame Joey again. It was really funny you were talking about when you first started doing your show. It's like Ariel and Joey were the first ones to say yes. They were also the first ones to say yes to me, and they didn't know me at all. Just so <laughs> in case you in case listeners you you think oh well you know Joey did the you know doing Mark a favor because he knows it. no they're just that nice. They're yeah, ridiculously nice. nice. Uh, Ariel said yes before anybody else had ever been on my podcast. That's awesome. So so um they're Canadian. Uh, I, yeah, they're they're great people. But yeah, thanks to you know watching those guys play and realize they were doing the pinky thing instead of the ring finger thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas I had developed all this control over you know eighteen years of playing slide on my ring finger. Right. Like, okay, but I I understand the advantage of playing with it on the pinky now. I'm going to retrain myself, and it has been a struggle to retrain myself with the pinky it's an awkward finger man like the pinky does not want to cooperate unless you really kind of put it to work it it doesn't but eventually it happens you know people just need to and and i think you know for all intents and purposes like you can use any finger you want man like oh yeah no absolutely bonnie Raitt doesn't she use her middle finger i think i think so and like the the reason I really saw the advantage even more than electric playing, because electric playing, I was fine either way. I, I still don't do very much behind the slide playing. Like I'm not really great at that. I I'm also playing my actions too low. My strings aren't heavy enough. So that's why, mm-hmm. but um, I play Dobro and I play the Dobro I had at the time. Actually, I can't remember now my Dobro I have now joins it. It's a 12 fret Dobro. So it joins at the 12th fret. So if I want to get that octave, it's a lot easier to get to that 12th fret with my pinky yeah. than it is to try to get to that 12th fret with my ring finger because then I've got a whole part of my hand that's got to find a new place behind the body to hide. Okay. So, yeah, switching the pinky made 12th fret dobro, play, Duolian style dobro playing a lot easier. So do you mean, are you playing like a round neck resonator? Yeah, round okay. neck resonator. So not like a square neck with a bar kind of thing? No, okay. no. I've, I've, I've done that too. I've still got my bar around here somewhere, but I don't own a square neck anymore. I I do not have that. There's, there's just something about that that made my hands cramp. And I was like, you know what? I can do this on a round neck. It'll be fine. Yeah. That's what my uncle plays. The uncle I mentioned earlier. Who he, he's oh, really? A, he's a bluegrass musician. So And he's he's 80 two now he's still doing it man he's still playing, oh man. see that's so rad yeah I, ho- I hope i can still hold a guitar at 82 that's just <laughs> yeah and and like it's funny too because i think he at the time when he introduced me to the beatles and stuff i think that's a period of his life when um he got out of music okay and i think when my stuff started happening i think he got juiced up again and was like oh yeah i forgot about this thing this is the thing that feeds my soul and i think i want to do this again And I think he, so I can't remember when he married because my aunt, I think it's her second husband, but anyway, so he's been in my life as long as I can remember, you know, but like he, yeah, he definitely, man, he, he can play too. He, um, I haven't seen him play live in a while, but like I had, I had him play on one of my records. I wrote like a bluegrassy folky thing a while back. Yeah. He played on it and that was pretty special. Um, but it's, you know, no one else in my family that's my blood you know my grandfather tinkered with playing some guitar but like right he, he didn't like he didn't play like to the level that i'm at now or anything so but man yeah it's definitely guitar is a, it's a drug <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's definitely like something that i hope like my daughter's getting into music more and she's playing piano more and i'm teaching her that and she's a good singer and 
Oh, that's so, awesome. You know, so like at some point I wanted to try the guitar. I wanted to do something where she can harmonically accompany herself and sing with it yeah. too. Cause that's, that there's so much joy that's on the table there, you know, for her. That's why, that's why piano is such a great instrument for that. And, um, well, that's also like, I think there's so many, there's so many musical opportunities now that, um, maybe weren't, especially for me growing up in a small town where despite Clarksdale's musical heritage, there wasn't a lot of music happening in Clarksdale when I was growing up. That mm. was like accessible to kids, especially, you know, you're not taking your kid down to the blues bar by the river kind of right. thing. Right. It, it not, no, you don't, you're not taking a nine year old to that. Um, it gets a little rowdy. Um, but yeah, learning it, I always, I recommend everyone learn a musical instrument. If not yeah. guitar, learn something. Don't care what it is. Play something. Learn. If you don't stick with it, that's great. I went through a whole thing when I was in music school. I was like, I came in as a guitarist. I learned piano. I'm not a great keys pl- uh, piano player, but I like playing keys. I like, you know, texture and feel and atmosphere that I can get with keys. Um, I had to take two years of it anyway for my degree. So, right. Um, but I also, I also tried clarinet, trumpet violin you know i i tried a bunch of stuff just to try other instruments because i think there's really really there's something that unlocks in you in just trying to do these things even if you don't get good at them uh that's the thing i also tell guitar players who are like uh you know i play guitar but i'm not very good i was like i don't care yeah you're probably better than you think and hey there is there is no prerequisite of being good at something to enjoy it exactly yeah yeah and it doesn't matter as long as you're having fun you know, yep. I say that all the time when I have students and stuff and they're just complaining. I'm like, dude, you you have to realize that you, you have to suck before you get better. That's just That's a it. plain and simple fact. Like, you're not going to be Eddie Van Halen in one week, bro. Like, it doesn't happen. Right. It, it took that guy a long time, too, man. It, there's a lot of I definitely have 10,000 plus hours. You know, and it's it's still not I'm still not happy. I like I listened to a rehearsal from this past weekend and I was like, Mark. You know, I'm just like, what? Like, chill out. Stop playing so many notes. Like, mm, whatever, mm, you know. Preach. Yeah. <laughs> preach. It, it's just, you know, it, it. there's things, there's a lot to be said. I love technology now because this is available for us to yeah. do this, for us to capture a rehearsal and listen back and be like, what can be better? It's yep. the only way we can improve. Like, if you're playing in your basement, like we did in high school. We weren't recording rehearsals. We weren't no. doing anything like that. We had a mini disc player. And sometimes we like would tour and like record shows because people would trade our yeah. shows. But like it wasn't a thing as much. It wasn't ex- yeah. as accessible as it is now. Whereas, um, whereas now the mixer that I use records stereo out to a to an SD card on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can record everything super simply in fact i'm running i'm running sound at a blues festival a little later this year for one of the mini stages Mm -hmm. and i'm just gonna bring my laptop and i'm gonna record every band's set and be like hey what's your what's your email address i'll get you these files if you want to take them to somebody to mix them and turn it into a live thing here's your files it's so simple why not why not it's so great I, i i love i mean there's so many people that are man get off my lawn technology and I'll tell you, man, like being a gear nut like I am and all the gear that comes across my desk. Do you like this pedal? I'm borrowing. And yeah, I borrowed the dream as well. And these things are freaking great. Like they really are like you. A I don't care. I, I might sound like a you a fanboy, but like. <laughs> But I'll tell you, man, like I'm going through an Apollo X4 right now, and that's the best yeah. money that I've spent in the past two years. I'm go I'm going through an Apollo Duo X right now. So it's um, they're amazing. I, I will say that and I've said this before, so I, I'm not afraid to say it on the podcast. I didn't have as good an experience with the dream. Mm-hmm. But you know what? Other people are getting great sounds out of it. But I I recent I picked this up recently actually from one of my Patreon supporters, had it for sale. Oh yeah. The Starlight. Nice. I'm a tape delay junkie, mm-hmm. and um, I now want all of the UA effects pedals. <laughs> I want yeah. I want all of them because this is ridiculous okay. how good this thing is. I I was a I was a detractor at first because I was like, wait wait wait, you you're gonna have a four hundred dollar delay pedal with no MIDI, 
Right. And yeah. now that I've played it, I was like, no, they made an amazing delay pedal where I don't need MIDI because I can change everything I want so quickly on the fly. Now, some people are going to say, no, I need it. No, I'm like, I don't need it. Yeah. Because like, I'm an improvisation person anyway. Um, anyway, that's a whole other ballgame. Actually, you know what, Mark? We've got a whole other Patreon episode where we're going to deep dive on some gear. We're okay. going to talk about gear because you do a ton of you do a ton of gear demos as well. But before we go, tell tell folks where they can find you. There's going to be links below too, in case you all are driving. Please don't use your phone while you're driving and try to right. look these things up. You can Please click don't. these links later. But where can where can we find you? So um, multiple places, um, not too many. Uh, but Instagram, it's just Mark Hopkins Music. I do, mm-hmm. you know, I'm I don't spend as much. I don't put as much energy into Instagram as I probably should. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Mark Hopkins music, I do this silly thing called uh, 5 p.m. Crank and Amp a couple times a week at, at five o'clock when I shut my laptop, when work is done and I am done whistling while I work, I play guitar. Um, I mean, it's usually I just put my phone up and it's a one taker. I just improvise and whatever happens, happens, clams and all. Um, so there and then um, YouTube is the same thing. Mark Hopkins music. I do a weekly demo um, of some kind of gear or I do a guitar lesson. And then every week my podcast is called at home with Mark. So I have guests on every week. Tons of people have been on Charlie Hunter. Talk about Tedeschi trucks. Gabe Dixon, who's the keyboard player from Tedeschi trucks. People like that. Um, yeah. Ariel Joey, uh, Oliver Wood from the Wood Brothers. Lee Pardini last night from Dawes. Like tons of amazing people. A bunch of the guys from Mo. Um, other jam bands. I'm starting. I'm becoming like the jam band guy, which is kind of neat <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Um, but I have a lot of a lot of people from like Dopapod and um, Lotus and uh, um, several other jam bands. Eggy, some other cats like that. They're all going to be on too. So I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. Um, once it stops being fun, I will probably hang up my uh, my revolvers. But until then, it's feeling good. Well, that's awesome. Well, like I, like I said, all the links are going to be down below, so you can just click them, follow, and while you're at it, uh, if you're a first-time listener or if you're a long-time listener and first-time viewer, all those things, click subscribe, bell, follow. <laughs> There's a bunch of other words for all, all the, the different players. Do all the things. Uh, rate and review. Remember, please rate and review, y'all. Especially, uh, especially all of you who are my Patreon supporters who give me so much support. I hate to ask you to do one more thing, but if you could rate and review if you haven't already, that would be super helpful. But here's my opportunity to thank all of my Patreon supporters by name. I used to call out, uh, even as of last week, I called out the amount that you're a subscriber. I'm going to stop doing that because there's they're starting to stack up a few of y'all and it's starting to take a while to say all the names. So <laughs> I'm just going to say names now. So thank you very much for all of your support. Blake Jefferson, Ben Fair of Electromotive Sound Company, Dan Pilver of Lewitt Microphones, Heath Bat, Alan Gresham, Andrew Hensley, Andy Koenig, Giacomo Ride, Jeffrey Walks, Jim Burns, Josh Gierkin, Kyle Harris, Nick Call, Rick Calhoun of Honey Picks, Scott Hamilton of the Effects Loop Podcast, Tom Kelly, and Dave Evangelista of the Guitar Dads Podcast. I appreciate all of your support. You keep this ship going. I just talk. So uh, I appreciate it. Mark, thanks so much. We're going to head over to the Patreon. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, man. Right on. All right. All right, listeners. Until next week. Uh, remember to uh, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and make some noise. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad free as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.